I found this obscure mini ITX motherboard while browsing AliExpress and it's got just about everything you'd expect. A normal range of ports and power connectors, a normal full length PCI Express slot, an ordinary pair of DDR5 memory slots, a soldered 8 core Ryzen mobile APU, a CMOS battery. Wait, back up just a sec. If, like me, you spend a lot of time browsing some of the weirder tech on AliExpress, the idea of a laptop CPU being repurposed for desktop use isn't all that new to you. There are enterprising folks over in Shenzhen who've been desoldering Intel mobile chips for ages, and either repackaging them into a standard LGA format for sale as desktop CPUs, or skipping the middleman altogether and soldering them straight onto a motherboard. This one is new to me. This weird little board from Topton costs about £250 before tax or just over $300 US dollars, and I paid £15 extra to get the low profile John's Bow cooler in case I ever wanted to assemble a full ITX system out of it. According to HW Info, it's called the AX7 ITX, but you probably won't find it under that name on AliExpress just yet. It's available with one of three different Ryzen APUs, the Ryzen 9 6900H with Zen 3.5 architecture and RDNA 2 graphics, the Zen 4 based Ryzen 7 7840HS with an RDNA 3 iGPU, or the Ryzen 9 7940HS, which is effectively a different bin of the same CPU. I chose the 7840HS as the best value option of the three, the 8 core 16 thread CPU with Zen 4 architecture and 16 megs of L3 cache is effectively a Ryzen 7 8700G, with all the pros and cons that come with it. In addition to the reduced cache size compared to a full fat desktop Ryzen 7000, it has just 8 lanes of PCIe 4 dedicated to the GPU slots. On the more positive side, it can turbo up to 5.1 GHz, has a TDP of just 35 watts configurable up to 54, and Radeon 780M integrated graphics. While no longer the best in the business thanks to the brand new Strix Point iGPUs, the 780M is still respectable for low spec gaming, emulation, and even modern AAA games for anyone who doesn't mind using a crap load of upscaling. The 7840HS has made its way into many mini PCs in recent years, and as something of a mini PC enjoyer, I've already tested it several times and know that it has the potential to compete with true desktop grade chips given enough power and cooling. To make this mobile chip compatible with desktop CPU coolers, the manufacturer has installed a custom heat spreader using what appears to be a block of aluminium and some thermal paste. However, I found that the block is too big to accommodate a stock AMD Wraith Stealth. Thankfully I bought that low profile John Spoke cooler, but I found it thermal throttled pretty quickly and after swapping the stock TIM on the heat spreader didn't have quite as big an impact as I'd hoped, I ended up switching to an impractically large thermal right dual tower cooler instead. If you're familiar with Ryzen powered mini PCs, then this board's connectivity options won't impress you. There's no USB 4 or Thunderbolt or even any Type C ports at all, just four USB 2s and two USB 3s, and Wi Fi is an optional extra. You do, however, get two HDMI and one Display Port and a pair of 2.5 gigabit Ethernet ports. On the board itself is a pair of Gen 4 NVMe slots and four SATA ports, as well as headers for front panel USB 2 and 3, and a curiously erect Wi-Fi card slot. This is advertised as a NAS motherboard, and I can see potential for it in that role, though I'd say it feels more like a general purpose product, and marketing it as a NAS board is probably not the angle I'd have taken. There's a similar concept board that was reviewed by Wendell over at Level 1 Techs recently, which costs a bit more money than this one, but I think will be more practical for that use case. My first impressions on booting the AX7 were that it's lacking polish. You get the same style of BIOS that most mini PCs come with, featuring an incredibly granular level of control for functions most people will never need, but lacking basic niceties like Expo or XMP profiles for the RAM. 
You get TDP control, but if you have more than a minimal amount of cooling, you won't get much extra performance this way, and it's more for configuring the 7840HS to work in a power or heat sensitive environment. There's manual memory clock and timing control in the BIOS, however it's kinda useless. The clocks are limited to a max of 4800 mega transfers, and regardless of what timings I plugged in when I loaded up HW info, it seemed they'd all reset to the default, painfully slow settings. Ryzen Master doesn't work with mobile APUs, so I was limited to using third party apps like Universal x86 Tuning Utility. While UXTU has access to some potentially useful stuff like Curve Optimizer and iGPU overclocking, it still doesn't allow me to directly affect memory speeds. So for the benchmarks, my 32GB DDR5 6000 kit is stuck at 4800 CL whatever. Running through my usual range of synthetics that I test mini PCs with, and we can see there's not much deviation from previous systems with the same APU. The Cinebench test comes in about a thousand points higher than even a newer generation Ryzen mobile chip, but it loses by a similar amount in Geekbench 6. In the two 3D Mark tests, the AX7 falls behind other mini PCs with the same Radeon 780M graphics, probably because most of them have memory running at 5600. If it were possible to get the RAM to run at its expo speed or even higher, then it could be a great way of squeezing a little extra performance out of this iGPU. Of course, I didn't pick this board up just to play with integrated graphics. The thing that first drew me to the AX7 is that full-length PCIe slot. It uses only 8 lanes of PCIe Gen 4, which is standard for most mobile chips and there's no real way around it, but that's still enough bandwidth to drive some serious performance. I've paired the AX7 with the RTX 3080 Ti, and for comparison I have numbers with the same GPU from two mini PCs via Thunderbolt and Oculus docks, as well as a desktop PC using the full 16 lanes. It should of course be pointed out that each setup has a different CPU, which could influence the result in certain situations. This isn't intended to be a perfect comparison between the four connectivity methods, but it should give you a frame of reference. Forza Horizon 5 gives a best case scenario for the AX7, despite losing PCIe bandwidth it still manages to score 130 FPS on average. This is within 5 frames of the same GPU connected to a full fat desktop CPU, and frankly that's not a noticeable difference. Perhaps a tad more noticeable is the drop off in 1% lows, falling from over 110 FPS to 94, which may be caused by the slower than usual system RAM. Still, compared to the Oculink mini PC setup, it's a very good result, and way better than the Thunderbolt dock. Turning up the quality to extreme and enabling in-game RT opens up the gap between setups quite considerably. Now the results show much more direct scaling between the X16 desktop, the X8 Topton board, and the X4 Oculink. The Last of Us is a game that leans pretty heavily on the CPU, but at 1440 Ultra, the mobile Ryzen shouldn't be any kind of bottleneck. The average of 79 FPS is only about 5% lower than the desktop Ryzen 5, and its 1% lows were, if anything, impressive by virtue of being so close to the 7500F. It's also far more playable than either of the eGPU solutions, though without further testing, I can't be sure of the limitations caused by their connection method or their CPUs. There are a couple of similar motherboards to the AX7 which have Intel mobile CPUs soldered on board instead, and Starfield might prefer one of those given its proclivity for the blue team. Maybe I'll get one of those to test in the future. In the meantime, in GPU limited situations, the 7840HS is doing a fine job, though the average FPS is a little below the 60 mark, whereas the 7500F scores well over 60 with this GPU. Turning on quality DLSS recovers that lost performance and still looks pretty sharp. Cyberpunk 2077 seems to be quite sensitive to the narrower PCIe bandwidth. The desktop can manage 82 FPS at ultra settings without upscaling, and while 1% lows do drop substantially, there's still the possibility of a near locked 60 FPS. 
the AX7 can't quite extract the same performance from the GPU, only managing an average of 69 FPS. Oh, I should probably round that up to 70. Nerd. By the way, the unexpectedly poor result from the Oculink setup isn't down to the interface, but the CPU. That particular mini PC has a Core Ultra 125H, which has 14 cores, but 10 of them are E-cores. Multiplayer titles, especially those with a revolving selection of arenas, don't always make the best choice for comparative benchmarking, but my numbers from Apex Legends do seem to make some kind of sense. There's very little difference between the results from either the desktop setup or the AX7, certainly not enough to worry about, and both are probably being held back by the engine somewhat. They are also both leagues ahead of the eGPU options. Finally, it is at least possible to be relatively consistent when benchmarking CS2, and yet there's a pretty steep fall off from the X16 desktop kit to the X8 one, losing over 40 frames, or about 17%. Obviously, this is sort of academic, as both results are way higher than needed to max out most 1440p monitors, but then the same drop off will apply on slower GPUs too, at least if they're X16 cards, so that's worth factoring in when choosing a GPU to match with the AX7. For a weird motherboard I found on AliExpress and bought on a whim, this is actually quite a bit better than I thought it would be. Not that it isn't janky of course, I don't think I mentioned this yet, but after placing my order, the seller contacted me to warn me that it only likes Samsung and Hynix memory and can be picky about storage too, and if I'm not an IT professional, I should probably cancel my order. I had no issues with my Corsair RAM, which has Hynix silicon, or either one of a pair of WD NVMe drives of varying ages and specifications, though if you're in the market for one of these, you should probably heed their warning, and also heed mine. I don't know about IT professionals, but unless you have a lot of patience and are willing to tolerate its general weirdness, you should probably steer clear of the AX7. The BIOS is unintuitive to say the least, the memory timings do nothing, in fact the clock limit of 4800 and the default latencies when you choose manual suggest to me that the BIOS was probably originally designed for an older chipset and hasn't been updated. I'll hold on to my AX7 for a while, just in case a new BIOS version is released that can better leverage the RAM frequencies and latencies, but I won't be holding my breath. Furthermore, the sheer size of the heat spreader means some coolers will have a problem installing, most notably the Wraith Stealth and presumably the Wraith Spire. If you can look past all this, however, what remains is a pretty decent mini ITX motherboard and CPU combo for around $300. Considering the price of an 8700G all on its own, this looks like a pretty good deal. And if you want to pair it with an X16 graphics card, you'll only notice a fairly small drop off in performance compared to a full desktop CPU. Even so, you can get a branded A620 ITX board for $140, or an Intel H610 for $100 or so if you don't mind DDR4, and once you factor in an appropriate CPU like a Ryzen 7 7700 or a 12th Gen i5 or i7, you're potentially paying the same or only slightly more than you are for an AX7. You'll get memory profiles, an anthropocentric BIOS, all 16 lanes of PCI Express, maybe even Wi-Fi. Ultimately, I'd say the extra cost is probably going to be worth it. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.